So, talking about post exploitation, which is basically what happens after you successfully break into a computer. So after a computer's been compromised, so you've gone through those steps that we talked about in the last few weeks. So you've done the information gathering. You've found out about what's actually on that system. You've found a vulnerability in that system. You've exploited that vulnerability. You've managed to get a shell on that system, for example. What comes next? Well, you know, depending on the scope of your security assessment, if you're a security tester, you might stop there and actually write a report and say, look, I found something and this is what it is. You might want to fix it. But often, if you're doing a penetration test, you'll be given permission to go further. Like, once you've hacked into a computer, that's basically just the start of what you're doing. And if you're a malicious actor, it really is just the start. Because getting into the system is what they needed to do in order to accomplish their goals. And what they do next is what they're actually aiming to do. So we've talked about the steps leading up to this. And now we're talking about what you can do after uh, exploiting a vulnerability. So what do you guys think might be some examples of what an attacker might do after having compromised a system? Privilege escalation. Privilege, privilege escalation, yeah, good. So let's like, see whether you can get even more privilege on that computer. Yeah, really good. Download the files. Download the files off the computer, so yeah, you might, you know, and why might you want to do that? Yeah, so some, some, some sensitive documents. Uh, so if you've managed to um, yeah, like hack into a corporate network and you get into you know, a server or something, there might be some really juicy stuff in there that could be helpful you know, to an attacker in, in various ways, yeah. Any other ideas? Key, key logger. So yeah, so like basically seeing what is being typed on that computer, starting to spy on the users of that system. Make your programs run in different ways. Yeah. That is not what you intended to do. Yes, so <clears throat> basically just doing stuff that they didn't want to happen. Yeah, I mean, all, all the things that an attacker does at this point is going to be something that they didn't want someone to have access to. So, yeah. Anything else? Scan on the networks. Like. Yes, so scanning, so you've broken into that computer. You start scanning for other networks that you can talk to and connect to because that's like your gateway into their enti entire internal network. Yep. Any other ideas? Put a malware or something for future visits. Sorry? Put a malware or something for future visits. Yeah, so leaving a back door. So some, some way of getting back in. Um, so maintaining access to the system. Yeah, good. Connected to the boot net. <laughs> Connected to a botnet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all these sorts of things are so, I mean, basically, your imagination's the limit. Once you've got access to a computer, you can do all sorts of things. Um, so, and all of, you, all of those comments were, were all really good. So, yeah, information gathering. So, you know, you're saying about scanning networks. But once you've actually broken into a computer, often you don't, you might want to be interested in finding out more about that computer that you've just compromised. What, what is this computer? Is it something that I'm interested in? You know, it depends how targeted the attack was to start with. Am I now on a server? What's on this server? What, um, what, what are the users on this server? You know, like just finding out as much as possible about it. And as you said, copying data, um, making modifications is another thing. So you might, might just be vandalism, where you know, just changing a, the website to say you got hacked or something, you know, pwned. Some, some kind of like comment or some hacktivism comment to, to say, you know, stop free Tibet or something, I don't know. Um, depending on what the, the goals are of the, of, of the attacker. Um, maybe making modifications in a more selfish way. So it might be actually, try, you know, changing their own account balance or something like that. Or, you know, shifting money around. Um, there might be you know, as you rightly said, privilege escalation. So trying to get more access and connecting and attacking other systems that are connected to it. Denial of service is another one. So actually, um, basically bringing things down. So that's um, the shortest um, post-exploitation phase is if you just crash the computer. So if you um, 
so some vulnerabilities will basically be a denial of service attack. And if you do a certain thing to that system, it'll either bring the system down or bring the service down, and that might be your goal. It, it means there's less you can do after that point if you brought down the system that you just attacked. But yeah, it's something that you could do. Uh, side note for your assignment, probably denial of service isn't the best choice because then you don't have much to write about for post-exploitation. Uh, impersonation. So, you know, once you've hacked into a computer, you could basically <coughs> pretend to have authorized access to that computer and then use an account that's on that computer to do further things. So there's all sorts of things and it all depends on what the goals and motivations are of the attacker. So there's a, obviously this hacktivism, so they're trying to make some kind of political point or you know, have some kind of message that they're trying to get across. There's organized crime, where there's essentially a number of people working together to make money out of it. Can you guys think of any other reasons or um, other motivations that people might have for attacking a system? Disgruntled employees, for example. You know, just there's just so many different things, you know, but they're just doing it because they're bored. You know, like they're bored teenagers and they're just trying it out because they can. You know, so many different reasons that people do these things. Uh, so, but that will change what they do once they've got access to a system. Maybe they fancy themselves as being white hat hackers and they're just doing it to report it to the company that there's a problem. Um, whether or not that's legal will depend on whether they've got legal permission to try it and do that. Um, but, you know, that. There are people that, or maybe you consider grey hats, that think that they're doing the right thing by trying to break into a computer. Um, so, so again, if you if it's if you're thinking of doing this, the the legal side of it is essentially if you don't have permission and you're hacking someone else's server, then you're breaking the law. There are a number of companies that have bug bounty programs that will basically give you permission to try and break into their computers. Um, but you do need to be careful that you're following all their rules. Um, but otherwise, you know, obviously just work for someone who gets hired to do this and then you get some paperwork that basically makes sure you don't end up in jail. Uh, so, <coughs> but the thing that's going to control what an, an attacker can do after compromising a system is actually the amount of access they've managed to gain. Because every hack is different. Like every security vulnerability, there are different levels of privilege that you can end up with on a computer that you've just broken into. So one of the best results for an attacker is actually ending up with shell access. So nothing to do with seashells, but what we're talking about is a bash terminal, for example. Or there is one called seashell, just to confuse you. But, but they're um, you know, like a command prompt to a system. So the Windows command prompt or the, a Linux command prompt, that's kind of like the holy grail of, of attacks. You want to get that kind of access so that you can run whatever pro commands you want on that system. And that will usually give you the ability to modify and read the files on that system. Um, you know, it is possible to get even higher level privilege if you end up in a kernel context, for example, so that you can run code in the kernel itself, um, but a shell is usually usually the end goal. So the first thing that you want to ask yourself if you've hacked into a computer is, have I got root? And how much access have I actually ended up with on this system? What's the security context of the process that I now control? So what user am I now running as? What security restrictions are in place? So are there actually access controls and security rules that define what I can now do on this system? Or have I ended up with just like super user access to everything? Um, so the most use access comes from having got super user access. So if you manage to break into a system and you end up with super user access, then that means that you are in a very privileged role on that computer. On a Windows system, what you're looking at is the SID, which is like the security context. If that ends with a 500, then you know your administrator, or also if you've got a system account, then that's, that's really good. On Unix, well, good for the attacker. On Unix, 
it's easy to remember. If your UID is zero, then um, you you have like a huge amount of access to that system. I was all, almost about to like do a rhyme with the word hero, but I don't know if that's going to come off as being a bit corny. But so so yeah, if you've got a UID of zero, then you basically have a huge amount of access to that machine. So how do we find out that information? Well, if you're on a Unix system, so like Linux or Mac or um, you know Solaris or any other Unix type system, you can use these kinds of commands. So who am I? We'll usually reply back with your username. So you can see um, here. So who am I? It returns back click. And if you type ID, then that will give a much more detailed feedback. So it says who, what the UID is. So in this case, the number 1000 is the UID for this user. And in brackets, click. So the word, the name Cliff is just like to make it easy to um, for a human to understand. But the actual computer itself looks at the number when it's making security decisions. There's a GID, so that's a group identity. Um, and that's 100 in this case, which is a user's group. And it shows a list of other groups that um, the user is also associated with. If you do ID dash U, then it just gives you the UID and there's a whole bunch of other flags you can use as well. But that's kind of the first thing that you do after breaking into a system, the very first step. What kind of access do I now have? So that's the first thing that you'll do. And you know, keeping in mind that there are access control rules that will specify what that user is allowed to do on that system. Now if we're actually configuring a, configuring a system to try and be secure, then most users should actually run as a normal user and not as root. So in this case, if I use cat, which is just printing out a file, via log messages, it will just say permission denied because the user clip doesn't get to do that. I need to actually use the root level access to get access to that file. So having said all that, if you just end up with user level access on a computer, so for example, you hacked into someone else in this room's computer and you got access not as an administrator, not as root, but just as them on their computer, what could you do? What kind of damage could you do? Yeah, so all their personal documents. You don't need root to get to all of your, you know, you know, all sorts of documents that you might have stored on your computer. Yeah. Any other suggestions? Yeah, yeah. And it's just like there's a lot you can do with just access to their system. So think about it. If they, if if you've hacked into their computer remotely. If they're using Facebook, you've got access to their Facebook account. You can, you know, steal their cookies. You now have Facebook. You've now got access to their Facebook. If they're doing internet banking, hey, you've still got internet banking. There might be some things, some two-factor authentication that make it more difficult, but you now um, can basically control their internet banking. If they are typing stuff on the computer, keylogger, you've got access to that stuff. Maybe depending on the system, a keylogger, you might not be able to do that without root access, but you might. Um, so there's, there's loads of stuff that you can do um, without requiring a uh, like root level access. And obviously I just mentioned some modifications and that will depend on the programs that are running. So if they're running, for example, Firefox, you can modify it by changing the extensions that are associated with that program and that's all in the user's home directory that you couldn't change the program itself without basically changing it so that they're actually running a different version. I guess you could, for example, change their desktop icon so that rather than running the version of Firefox that you can't change because it's on, you know, you don't have access to change that, you could just put a different version of Firefox on their computer, link to that, and then hey, you can check, do whatever you want to that program. So there's, there's a lot you can do with just access to someone's um, local user account. Can you think of any other restrictions that might um, stop what a program can do on a system? Sandboxing is an example of that. So if the um, if there's a program running in a sandbox and you manage to compromise that program, 
you might be very restricted in the kind of damage you can do to that computer. So say for example, um, how many of you guys um, actually use Adobe Reader? Show of hands. Yeah. Uh, how many of you guys update it every time? Like you've got the most recent version of Adobe. If you don't have the most recent version of Adobe, just show your hands. Go on, be honest, it's fine. There's not many of you, but surely, so you, you really, you've all got the most recent version. All right, well, congratulations. Usually when I ask that, there's a few, quite a few people that don't. And my answer to that is that, well, you know, as you guys will have learned from the labs that we've actually just you know, already done in this module, you can basically compromise a um, system by creating a malicious PDF document Sending it to someone, if they got that old version of Adobe Reader that, have, that has those vulnerabilities, you get like access to their machine because you get full control of that Adobe Reader process. Now, if that Adobe Reader process was running in a sandbox, you might not be able to do any damage to that computer because that sandbox will restrict what that program can do. But if, as like most people, you don't run that in a sandbox, then you might be able to do all kinds of damage now, in saying that, Adobe Reader has a sandbox built into it nowadays, but it is often circumvented. So it's like it's like a Swiss cheese sandbox. But I'm, I'm talking about like if you actually use something like Sandboxy if you're in, if you're on Windows, uh, where you can actually run that program and see exactly what it's trying to do. So um, the next step. So you know what user you're running as but you want to know more about the computer. So you might start with um, viewing the environment variables. So the environment vari variables are things like, you know, what, where your home directory is and what programs are used, you know, to, to start certain types of, um, you know, where the location of Java is and, you know, all sorts of, there's just a lot of stuff and you can see that, that screenshot on the screen there, there's, there's just a lot, there's a lot more even that's shown on the screen there. Um, but just looking through that, so you can see, for example, you know, if there's any proxies that are being used um, and all sorts of things, so I can see here I'm using KDE, um, so there's all kinds of interesting information that could be helpful to an attacker, just to understand the system a bit more. Some other things you can do is like look at cat so you use CAT to look at um, PROC CPU info. You know, what kind of system are we talking about? What have we broken into? Is this like a supercomputer or just like a server or someone's desktop computer? You can use free-m, which will show you like the amount of <coughs> RAM that's currently free on the computer. Just, as, just to understand more about this computer. DF-H display file systems will give a list of all the file systems, so you know, other CDs plugged into it as like, like a RAID array. Do you have, um, like how many hard drives are there and how much free space is there and all that sort of stuff. So it's a DF dash H, the dash H is like human readable, so that instead of doing it in bytes, it's in gigabytes and megabytes. So that's, that would be one of the first things you do just to try and understand it. Uname dash A is gonna print out the version of um, the Linux Linux that's on there with all the details including like what version of the of the kernel and everything is there. So these are some sorts of commands that you run. And every time you gain access to something new, you've got a new attack surface. So if you now, you know, to start with, you didn't have access to these computers, you're doing some scanning, you're finding out about what's there, you break into that computer, but the point where you've broken into that computer you've now got a whole bunch of more stuff that you could potentially attack. So, you know, the things like privilege escalations. So maybe there's another vulnerability on the system that we couldn't see from where we were to start with. So when we were at the start, we could just see, for example, network ports. And that could have been enough to hack into a program that was running there as a normal <coughs> user. Once they're on that system, we can see, well, oh, this is an old version of Linux kernel is known to have this vulnerability or Windows same thing and there's some way that I can escalate my privileges to basically get even more access to, access to the computer and that, that at, at that point you're like okay what can I see now that I couldn't see before that I can break into. So there's, at each stage you want to assess the, the um, attack surface, what can you attack and what are the ways that I could misuse the access that I have. 
so in Metasploit, so the Metasploit framework, there are post exploitation modules that can ease all these steps for you, that kind of can automate this stuff. So after you've successfully attacked using Metasploit, there are all these post exploitation modules. Um, and a lot of them just like take control of a shell and then automate things that you might want to do. But they also, they'll download things to your local computer. You can, for example, ask it, am I in a virtual machine? It will do some stuff and say, it looks like we are in, um, you know, a, you know, it might be able to tell you what kind of virtual machine you're, you're running in. It, you can use it to gather all sorts of information like config information. You can find like, what the, what's the networking? What IP address do I have now? What networks am I attached to? What's the user history? You know, what, what commands has this user run in the past? Is there a Firefox history that I can look at? All this sort of stuff can all, can all be gathered. And you could do it all manually from a shell, but also if you use post-exploitation modules, it can ease all of those steps. You can do things like gather password hashes. So you don't know what the passwords were, potentially, when you broke into this computer. But now that you have access to the computer, you can see the hashes of the passwords. So at that point, you can try using a password cracker to try and guess what the password was for those hashes. And then once you've got the password, you could have access to a whole bunch of other stuff because all the other computers that are on that network, you might be able to log in with the same password. Or, heaven forbid, they might be using the same password for like all of their internet stuff. In which case, you can access you know, Gmail accounts and all, you know, Google in general and all these other things. So there's so much that you can do once you've broken in that it's just like, you know, it really is just the start. Uh, so there's another very clever thing that is included in the Metasploit framework is an advanced payload known as Meterpreter. So we've been talking about once you get shell access, which is basically you get the ability to type in commands on that computer. Meterpreter is like a step up from that because it has loads of features that can automate things that you might want to do as an attacker. And if you want a shell, it'll give you a shell, but it can also do all sorts of interesting things. So it was de originally developed by Matt Miller, also known as Skate. Um, <coughs> it exists entirely in memory. It never touches the hard disk. So if you're doing a forensic investigation, you'll never find an interpreter on the hard disk. It's never there. It only, once you've hacked into the computer, it just exists in memory. Once you turn the computer off, it, it goes away. You can set up things to be persistent, but obviously then you um, have to put something onto the hard drive. But it is possible to basically ent remain entirely in memory. And it can also migrate between processes. So you can actually um, not just have this um, separate process. So if you're on Windows, for example, and you press uh, whatever it is, control or escape, and you come up with that process list, it's not there. I mean, I mean, if you, it might hide itself there with some kind of rootkit thing. But in order to avoid it being listed there, you can migrate your process and basically insert that process into an existing process. So for example, if you've got, you can see that there is a program running on that computer you've hacked into, let's just migrate this program into that other program. And now that will only go away if they close that program. And if they look at a process list, we're not there because actually we're just running as a thread inside this other program. So very clever. But you might want to migrate into existing processes like SVC host <coughs> or Explorer, which are almost always there on a Windows system. If you insert yourself into one of those processes, then um, you know, you're, you're not likely to be disturbed because no one's going to be killing those processes without disturbing their own Windows experience. Um, so yeah, I guess I've answered that next question about what that means for analysis for forensics and investing incident response. It makes it hard because it's not necessarily any evidence there unless you're logging things. So you might have logged some network traffic that gives you an indication that something happened. Again, it's all encrypted if we're using Meterpreter, but there's something there that might look a bit suspicious. Um, if we're logging behavior on the computer, we might pick something up. But unless we're doing some really active logging and things, it's hard because if you look at a computer afterwards, 
you'd have to basically look at things like what's changed on the system. What are the results of what the attack's done rather than let's look at the actual malware that's there because it might not be on the disk. Uh, so yeah, traffic's encrypted. Meterpreter is a staged payload, which means that, um, so you, the way that a buffer overflow works, just briefly, is basically that, so buffer overflow is one of the most common types of security vulnerability, which is like a, often a one line programming mistake in some C code or C++ code, which are very popular programming languages. But it's where you don't check that what you're reading in fits into the space you're trying to put it in. So as a result, you can put a whole bunch of stuff over the existing memory and basically it writes over the stack. And if you write over the um, return pointer, you end up basically um, having control of the computer because we now control what the program's gonna execute next. And there's all kinds of clever ways you can um, take advantage of that. But the, way, the reason I bring it up is because there's often a size that you can fit the payload into, depending on the attack. There might only be a very small amount of space to actually fit the payload. So what a stage payload does is it just gets that first piece of the payload to load some more payload later. So basically, um, <clears throat> so if it's a single or inline payload, it's self-contained and it fits into the space. If it's a stage payload, there's a small stager that pulls down the rest of the stage payload, and it might do that over the network, <clears throat> uh, and then it executes it. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so some of the features included in Meterpreter are things like spyware. So there's key logging features in Meterpreter. There's screen capture features. So you can um, look at what the user's looking at now. You can pull that down onto your own computer. What's on? What's displayed on that remote computer? You can run system commands like from the interpreter shell access, so you can do things like. But also, you can do things like the get UID command, which is not. It's not always easy to do that on a Windows system if you've got shell access. Just to quickly and easily see exactly what the security context is, you can, you can get there eventually. But this means you can basically use just type get UID, and it will tell you what the process context is, like what your security context is. And it's the same command whether it's a Windows or a Linux system if you're using Meterpreter. Um, it allows you to download and upload files quite easily. Again, if you've just got a shell, you can achieve that, but there's more commands involved in actually getting a file from that computer to your own. Um, you can run post-exploitation modules that I've just been that just discussed before to do things like find out whether you're in a virtual machine, gather information. You can do pivoting. So this is what I'm about to talk about in a minute. And that's where you route your attack through the computer you've just compromised. So I hack into your computer, and now I want to hack everyone else's computer, but I don't want everyone to see that what my IP address is. So I do it via your computer, and hey, all you guys just see that IP address. Um, and if I ever want a shell with an interpreter, I just type shell, and it gives me one. So it's very, very cool, very clever, uh, very powerful payload. Uh, so other payloads you can use is things like BNC, which is basically a remote desktop protocol. So um, you, you can basically install a server on the remote system and then you can connect via a client with BNC Viewer. Uh, you can do your reverse connections and things. Um, it's possible to configure the client so that it's read-only so, um, for example, if I've compromised a system, so I attack a system, I get access to it, I can set up VNC, I can connect to it and see the desktop. It's possible for me to like move the mouse and just use the desktop, but I can also set it up so that it doesn't, I can't move the mouse. Any reason why I might do that? Yeah, and there's nothing like more suspicious than seeing a like, cursor moving around on the computer and clicking things by itself. It's like, that's probably not what an attacker usually wants to do. You can achieve all, everything you want to do without having access to the graphical interface. You do almost everything interesting from the command prompt and from interpreter. Um, but you might want to just to spy on the user just to see what's happening on that computer. And as a last resort, you might want to like take control of that computer to do something. Um, so maybe, for example, you need to click something on a graphical program 
on that computer in order to access something. Maybe the only way to get to do something on that computer is via an actual graphical program. So in that case, you could do that. Um, it's often not what you want to do, uh, but it is possible. So pivoting, as I said, is routing attacks um, <clears throat> through a compromised system. So can you think of any reasons why an attacker might want to do this? Why, why would I? Yeah, just to avoid avoid being caught, so that it's basically an extra step of um, anonymity, I guess, or pseudo anonymity. You know, it depends how many steps there are, and if I can, if I'm fairly certain that I can delete the log files off the computer that I've hacked into, then that does provide a level of protection. Um, but obviously, if the if you if someone has access to the computer I've hacked into they can see my IP address, right? So maybe you want multiple levels of removal. But also you can, you know, you can use things like Tor and um, you know, third party VPNs and all that sort of stuff to add that level of untraceability. But if you just imagine someone's using a proxy server that doesn't log, a um, VPN server that doesn't log and Tor all at the same time, plus pivoting via an attack machine, what chance do you have of ever finding out who the attacker is? Slim to none. Um, yeah, so there are a few reasons why you might want to do that. So if you're a large organization with a, a DMZ, so a demilitarized zone, um, which is basically when you set up the network to have an area of the network that people can get to from the internet. Um, so that's things like your servers and things that you want people to get to. So that's the dem demilitarized zone. And then beyond that, you've got your intranet, which is stuff that you don't want the outside world to get access to. So, but often they're connected via the servers and things that are on, in that demilitarized zone. So if you do manage to, for example, break into one of the servers, from there, you can probably see the internal network. And at that point, you've got a way of in to that network. So you can start to communicate um, with the intranet and maybe start attacking those systems. And I've actually just talked about what log files show. So what, what you would see if you looked at the log files of a system being attacked from the intranet, you'd see, oh, my server's attacking me, that's a bit weird. Went onto the server and the attacker hadn't deleted the log files and although it was still happening, you could look at what the IP address is that's connected to that computer. No guarantee that that's the actual attacker, but it could be. Um, so yeah. So this, the ways that you can pivot, there's a number of different methods. One of the simplest ways is say I hack into your computer, I then upload some hacking tools onto that computer, and from the command line I can just start firing up the command, the, the tools. It's not particularly ideal because now I've got a whole bunch of evidence on that computer of all the tools I was using and all the commands I'm running. But it's, one, it's the easiest way of doing it. So I've hacked into Stig's computer, I upload all my hacking tools, and I fire them off. Yeah, one way to do it. Another way is to do port forwarding. So I could basically, once I've hacked into your computer, I say, okay, every time you receive a connection on port, I don't know, 1050, I want you to forward that on to this other computer on you know, port 80 or whatever. And now I can just connect to that computer and it will automatically actually be connecting to some other computer. So you can do things like, like that where it's port forwarding. So basically routing specific traffic through a port. <clears throat> but you can also do actually like dynamic routing where you actually set up a, um, you know, a connection to that computer and just route all your traffic through. And um, Materpreter can make um, both of those more advanced methods much, much easier. So at the start, someone also mentioned about covering tracks, I believe. Um, so if you want to actually avoid being caught, you can do things like install rootkits on the system you know, in order to modify the system and the operating system to hide malicious files and processes. You might want to um, disable, delete, or modify log files. <clears throat> what do you think is better, disabling logging or deleting all the log files? Modify. Yeah, why? Yeah, 
Not all of them. Then if you, you, yeah, you might have hidden your tracks, but also you might be raising alarm, alarm bells. Like if you're looking and there's no log files on your computer, it's like, Whoa, what's going on here? Whereas if you just have deleted certain things from the logs, and like, you know, you delete the first event, disable the logging, do some stuff, re-enable it, you know, no one's the wiser. Uh, now there's nothing in the logs to show. Uh, so yeah, it's probably more like what you'd want to do. Use anti-forensics. So things like steganography, so hiding information in information. So for example, you can have a, um, an image file, like a JPEG image or something, any kind of image, and have all sorts of information encoded into that, where you have to look at the image and it looks perfectly fine, but if you know there's information in there, you can get it back out again. So if you want to hide information on a system, that's one of the ways you can do that. Um, you can modify timestamps. So you, you might want to actually you know, make sure that any of the files that you change, you actually put the timestamp back to how it was before, so that if they're looking... Because one of the things that you do in a forensic investigation is look at the time sequence of events. So you do this timeline, and the way that works is there are these like access times associated with all the files on your computer. But if you're the root user, you can change all that stuff. It just depends how lazy you are, I guess. But if you, you can make life really hard by for, for a forensic investigator if you actually just change all those things. You can just reset the entire system. Again, might raise some flags, but it's gonna make it a lot harder to investigate if the time set's exactly the same for every file on the computer. But again, if there are files that you've changed, you can just update the time set so that they can't tell that they've changed uh, you know, within that time frame, unless they're doing other kinds of things to detect changes. Um, you could also just zero out disk contents and just wipe everything. You know, that there's not much anyone can do about that if you just delete everything unless they've got a backup. So almost finished, maintaining access. They might want to be able to get access again. They might do that by adding a user account. You know, again, it's a bit obvious, maybe, depending on how many user accounts there are on that system, but maybe you can get away with it. Just add a user account, and then you've got access to it again. Or maybe you include um, some kind of backdoor, some process running that allows you to get access. Uh, maybe a new service that starts on reboot. You can even do things like port knocking so that it the port's not even visible until you try accessing it and then it can become available and things. There's all sorts of clever things you can do. Um, you might even fix the original problem that you used to get into the system if you're, the, if you're an attacker so that when they do a security audit, they don't detect there was a problem. So then, you know, less likely to fix the problem and detect it. So yeah, there's so many things in the news that have happened recently. And ironically, I made this slide um, last year but the Sony logo is even more <laughs> relevant now than it was then, uh, obviously with the Sony Pictures hack. There's been loads of stuff in the news. We don't have time to discuss it now. Um, but yeah, there's been all sorts of things that attackers do after gaining access. And obviously you all know about the Sony Pictures attack that happened recently. So in conclusion, once an exploit is successful, it's just the beginning of the end. There's so much stuff. So the attackers won, basically. They can make the system do things that are not meant to do. They can read and modify files, compromise confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Attacker may be able to get even more privilege or launch further attacks. Um, and obviously, security professionals are trying to avoid this. So you're trying to actually defend the system to stop this from happening in the first place. But you need to plan for this to happen. It needs to be part of the security plan that once an attack's happened, we need to find a way of detecting that it's happened and responding to it. Uh, because, you know, if all of these huge companies can't keep themselves, stop themselves from being attacked, what chances do we all have, basically? At some point, you need to assume that you get, there's going to be a compromise, but you need to be ready to deal with it. Thank you, guys, and I'll see you next week.